So a couple weeks ago, uh, Mark called me and said, um, we got to get you out. Richard and I want to talk to you. And so they, they got Nathan Mirvold's Gulfstream, and they flew it to San Francisco, and then they flew me to Newport. Uh, and we went to Richard's castle. And uh, they said, uh, we've been up and down the speaker list, and you are the only one brave enough to follow Steve and Seku. So <laughs> here I am. Uh, so, so thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm, I'm proud to follow in the, the uh, history of, of Wired as Richard said, and I want to show you one of the things I'm going to show you today is a sneak preview from um, something that we've come up with at Wired. Uh, what I want to frame it with, though, is the, the notion that I'm going to be talking to you about how uh, we can tap a really underutilized resource in healthcare, which is the patient, um, or as I like to use the, uh, the scientific term, people. Um, because we are all patients, we are all people, even doctors are patients at some point. So I want to talk about that as an opportunity that we really have, have failed to engage with very well in this country, and in fact, worldwide. Um, the, the premise that I want to start with is this one, that healthcare, even though you're going to see all sorts of cool things this week, right? I mean, you've already seen some amazing things, um, a lung, uh, among other things, and some cool uh, innovations, technologies, tools, diagnostics. Uh, a lot of the things, those are, those are going at a kind of a small wedge of the vast majority of our, of our healthcare problems. If you really want to get at the, the big part, I mean, from a public health level, where, where my training is, you're looking at behavioral issues. You're looking at things where people are actually given information and they're not following through with it. It's a, it's a problem that roots, it, that finds its, um, uh, it manifests itself in diabetes, um, obesity, many forms of heart disease, even some forms of cancer when you think of smoking. Those are all behaviors where people know what they're supposed to do, right? They know what they're supposed to be doing, but they're not doing it. So that's a problem. And that's what I think we can actually solve, one of the many things we can solve. Um, so the crux of it comes down to this notion of decision making, giving information to people in a form that doesn't just kind of educate them or, or inform them, but actually leads them to make better decisions, better choices in their lives. And that is, as I said, the notion, the, the nut um, of behavior change. Now, behavior change is something that, that is a long-standing problem in, in medicine. It goes all the way back to Aristotle. Um, and, and doctors hate it, right? I mean, they complain about it all the time. We talk about it in terms of engagement or non-compliance. Um, when people don't take their pills, when people don't follow doctor's orders, these are behavior problems. Um, but for as much as clinical medicine kind of um, agonizes over behavior change, it, there's not a lot of work done in terms of trying to fix that problem. So um, I want to point to how we might do that. One part of medicine, though, has faced um, the, the problem of behavior change pretty well, and that's dentistry. Dentistry might seem, and I think it is, uh, many dentists would have to acknowledge, it's somewhat of a mundane backwater of medicine. Not a lot of cool, sexy stuff happening in dentistry. But they have really taken this problem of behavior change and solved it. It's the one great preventive health success we have in our healthcare system. People brush and floss their teeth, right? They don't do it as much as they should, but they do it. So I'm going to talk about one experiment that um, a couple dentists, a few dentists in uh, Connecticut co cooked up about 30 years ago. So this is an old experiment, but it's a really good one because it was very simple. So it's an easy story to tell. So these Connecticut dentists decided that they wanted to try to get people to brush their teeth and floss their teeth more often. And they were going to use one variable. They wanted to scare them. They wanted to tell them how bad it would be if they didn't brush and floss their teeth. So they divided, they, they had a big um, patient population, they divided them up into two groups. They had a low fear population, where they basically um, gave them a 13 minute presentation, all based in science, but um, told them that uh, if you didn't brush and floss your teeth, you could get gum disease. If you get gum disease, you'll lose your teeth, uh, but you'll get dentures and it won't be that bad. So that was a low fear group. The high fear group, they laid it on really thick, all right? They showed them slides of, uh, Blood, you know, bloody gums. I'm sorry to get graphic, but you're, you're, you're in the medical industry. Uh, you can take it. Um, they showed bloody gums. They showed pus kind of oozing out from between their teeth. They told them that their teeth were going to fall out. Um, they said that they could have infections that would spread from their, their jaws to other parts of their bodies. And ultimately, yes, they would lose their teeth. They would get dentures. And if you got dentures, you weren't going to be able to eat corn on the cob. You weren't going to be able to eat apples. You weren't going to be able to eat steak. You'll eat mush for the rest of your life. So. Go brush and floss your teeth, right? That was the message. That was the experiment. 
Now, they measured one other variable. They wanted to capture one other variable, which was the patient's sense of efficacy. This was the notion of whether the patients felt that they actually would go ahead and brush their floss their teeth. So they asked them at the beginning, do you think you'll actually be able to stick with this program? And people who said, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty good about that, uh, they characterized this high efficacy. And the people said, ah, you know, I never get around to brushing or flossing as much as I should. They characterized as low efficacy. So the upshot was this. The upshot of this experiment was that fear was not really the primary driver of, be of the behavior at all. The people who brushed and flossed their teeth were not necessarily the people who were really scared about what would happen. It's the people who simply felt that they had the capacity to change their behavior, right? So fear showed up as, as not really the driver. It was a sense of efficacy. So I want to I want to isolate this because it was a great observation 30 years ago, right? 30 years ago, and and it's one that kind of is laid fallow in in research. It was a notion that um, really came out of Albert Bandura's work. Um, Stanford, University, Stanford University, great social science who, who studied whether um, people could kind of, uh, get a sense of empowerment. The notion of efficacy basically boils down to one that um, if somebody believes that they have the capacity to change their behavior. And in healthcare terms, you could characterize this as whether or not somebody feels that they see a path towards better health, right? That they can actually see their way towards getting better health. And that's in a very important notion. It's an amazing notion. We don't really know how to manipulate it, though that well, except maybe we do. So fear doesn't work, right? Fear doesn't work. And this is a great um, example of how we haven't learned that lesson at all. This is a, a campaign from the American Diabetes Association, uh, Ronnie Zeiger from Google Health and uh, Seduce Health. This is a kind of thing that Seduce Health is using. This is the, still the way we're communicating messages about health, right? I mean. I showed my three-year-old this uh, slide last night, and he's like, Papa, why is an ambulance in this, these people's homes? And I, I had to explain, well, it's, it's they're trying to scare people. Um, and, and I don't know if it works. Certainly might work to scare that, that fellow Hank, but I don't know if it works to actually get people to change our behavior. Now, here's what does work. Personalized information works. Again, Bandura re recognized this years ago, decades ago. When you give people specific information about their health, where they stand, and where they want to get to, where they might get to, that path, that notion of a path, that tends to work for behavior change. So let me just spool it out a little bit. So you start with personalized data, right? personalized information that comes from an individual. And then you need to connect it to their lives. You need to connect it to their lives, hopefully not in a fear-based way, but one that they understand, OK, I know where I sit. I know where I'm situated. And that doesn't just work for me in terms of abstract numbers, this kind of, kind of overload of health information that we're kind of inundated with, but it actually hits home, right? It's not just hitting us in our heads, it's hitting us in our hearts. There's an emotional connection to information because it's from us. That information then needs to be connected to choices. It needs to be connected to a range of options, directions that we might go to, trade-offs, benefits. Finally, we need to be presented with a clear point of action. We need to connect the information always with the action. And then that action feeds back into different information. And it creates, of course, a feedback loop, right? Now, this is a very well-observed and well-established notion for behavior change. But the problem is that thing in that, that upper right corner there, personalized data, it's been pretty hard to come by, right? It's a difficult and expensive commodity until now. So I'm going to give you an example, a simple, very simple example of how this works. So we've all seen these, right? This is, these are the your speed limit signs, and you see them all around, especially these days as radars are cheaper. And here's how they work in the feedback. So you start with the personalized data where the road, the speed limit on the road that you are at that point is 25. And of course, you're going faster than that, right? We always are. We're always going above the speed limit. Uh, the choice in this case is pretty simple. We either keep going fast or we slow down. We should probably slow down, and that point of action is probably now. We should take our foot off the pedal right now. And generally, we do. These things are shown to be pretty effective in terms of getting people to slow down. They, they reduce speeds by about 5 to 10%. They last for about five miles, um, in which case we put our foot back on the pedal. Um, but it works, right? And it even has some health repercussions, right? Your blood pressure might drop a little bit. Maybe there's fewer accidents, so there are public health benefits. Um, but by and large, this is a, a feedback loop that's so nifty and, and too rare. Because in healthcare, most healthcare, the data is very removed from the action, right? It's very difficult to kind of line things up so neatly. But we have an opportunity. So I want to talk about, I want to shift now to think about how we deliver health information in this country, how we actually get information. 
This is a uh, pharmaceutical ad. Um, actually, it's a spoof. It's not a real pharmaceutical ad. <laughs> Nobody's had the brilliant idea of calling a, uh, their drug have it all quite yet. Um, but it looks completely right, right? So, so it's, a, it's, it's exactly the way we get health um, information, pharmaceutical information, and it just sounds perfect. And then we turn the page of the magazine, and we see this, right? We see this. Now, this is the page that the FDA requires pharmaceutical companies to put into their ads, or to have follow their ads. And to me, this is one of the most cynical exercises in medicine. Because we know, right? Who among us actually would honestly say that people read this? And who among us would actually say that people who do try to read this actually get anything out of it, right? This is, this is a bankrupt effort at communicating health information. There is no good faith in this. And yet this is still the way we perpetuate the notion of communicating information to people. So this is a different approach. This is an approach that has been um, developed by a couple researchers at um, Dartmouth uh, Medical School, Linda Schwar Lisa Schwartz and Stephen Wolschen, and they created this thing called the drug fax box. They took inspiration from, of all things, Captain Crunch, right? They went to the nutritional information box and saw that what works for cereal, what works for our food, actually helps people understand what's in their food. God forbid we should use that same standard that we make Captain Crunch live by and bring it to drug companies, right? So let me just walk through this quickly. Uh, it, it says very clearly what the, health in, what the drug is for, specifically who is it good for, so you can start to personalize your understanding of whether the information is relevant to you or whether the drug is relevant to you. You can understand exactly what the benefits are. You know, it isn't this kind of uh, vague promise that it's going to work no matter what, but it actually you get the statistics for how effective it is. And finally, you understand what those choices are. You can start to unpack the choices involved because the side effects, right? Every, every time you take a drug, you, you're walking into a possible side effect. So it spells those out in very clean terms. And that works. So I went, um, I, I love this. I love the drug facts box. And so I was thinking about what's an opportunity that, that I could have to help people understand um, information? What's another kind of latent uh, body of information that's out there that people are really not putting to use? And so I came up with this, lab test results. Blood test results are this great source of information. They're packed with information. They're just not for us. They're not for people. They're not for patients. They go right to doctors, and God forbid, I think many doctors, if you'd really get asked them, they don't really understand all this stuff either. This is, this is the worst presented information. You, I mean, you, you, ask, you ask Tufti, and he would say, yes, this is, this is the absolute worst presentation of information possible. So uh, what we did at Wired was we, we went and, and I got our graphic design department to reimagine these lab reports. So that's what I want to walk you through. So this is the general blood work before, and this is the after. This is what we came up with. The after takes what was four pages. That previous slide was, was actually the first of four pages of data. That's just kind of the general blood workup, right? It goes on and on and on. All these values, all these numbers, you don't know what, what they're really getting at. This is our one-page summary. It spools out everything in very, we use the notion of color. God, it's, a, it's an amazing notion that color could be used. So on the top level, you have your, your overall results, the things that might jump out at you from the um, fine print. Um, then you can drill down and get, um, understand how actually we put your level in context and we use color to illustrate um, exactly where your value falls. In this case, this patient is, is slightly at risk of diabetes because of their um, glucose level. Uh, likewise, you can go over your lipids and again understand what your overall co um, cholesterol level is and then um, break down into the HDL and the LDL if you so choose. But again, always using color and, and um, personalized proximity to that, that information. All those other values, all those pages and pages of values that are full of nothing, we summarize. We tell you that you're, you're okay, you're normal, but you don't have to wade through it. You don't have to go through the junk. And then we do two other very important things that kind of help fill in this feedback loop. We help people understand in a little more detail what these values are and what they might indicate. And then we go a further step. We tell them what they can do. We give them a, some insight into what choices they can take, what actions they can take. So that's our general blood work test. Then we went to a CRP test. This is a cardiology report that's used often um, after a high cholesterol test uh, to uh, see if somebody's um, blood vessels, it's a, it's a protein that shows up when your, your um, blood vessels might be inflamed, which might be a risk for heart disease. So the CRP test, um, in this case, it's a, it's a sin of omission. They have this huge amount of space and they don't use it for anything, so we, we do. Um, 
This is our after. Uh, now, the CRP test is often done in, as I said, in following a, a glucose, or a, I'm sorry, following a cholesterol test or in conjunction with a cholesterol test. So we take the bold step of putting the cholesterol information on the same page, um, which is the way the doctor is going to con uh, evaluate it. So we thought that the patient might actually want to know the context as well. Um, so here's the way it plays out. The CRP, um, uh, what you're actually measuring is spelled out in clean language. Um, then we use the information that's already in the lab report. We use the, the person's age and their gender to start to fill in the personalized risk. So we start to use the, the, the data we have to run a very simple calculation that's it's on all sorts of online calculators to get the sense of what the actual risk is. And then again, we follow, through that, follow up with choices. Um, the last one that I'll show you is a PSA test. There's the before and here's the after. Now, a lot of our effort on this one, um, as many of you probably know, PSA test is a very controversial test. It's used to test for prostate cancer, um, but you know, there are all sorts of reasons why your prostate might be enlarged. Um, and so we, we spend a good deal of our time indicating that. Um, we again personalize the risk, so this patient is in their 50s, so we can actually give them a very precise um, estimate of what their risk for prostate cancer is. In this case, it's about 25% based on that. And then again, the follow-up actions. So our cost for this was less than $10,000, all right? That's what Wired Magazine spent on this. These are Wired, I mean, why is Wired Magazine doing this? <laughs> Quest Diagnostics and LabCorp, the two largest lab testing companies. Last year, they made profits of over $700 million and over $500 million, respectively. Now, this is not a problem of resources. This is a problem of incentives, right? We need to re recognize that the target of this information should not be the do doctor, should not be the insurance company. It should be the patient. It's the person who actually, in the end, is going to be having, having to change their lives and then start adopting new behaviors. This is information that is incredibly powerful. It's an incredibly powerful catalyst to change. But we're not using it. It's just sitting there. It's being lost. So I want to just um, offer four questions that any patients sh uh, every patient should ask. Um, because we, I don't actually expect people to start feel, uh, developing these, these lab test reports, um, but you can create your own feedback loop. Anybody can create their feedback loop by asking these simple questions. Can I have my results? And the only acceptable answer is yes. yes. What does this mean? Help me understand what the data is. What are my options? What choices are now on the table? And then what's next? How do I integrate this information into the longer course of my life? So I want to wind up by just showing that people have the capacity to understand this information. This is not beyond the grasp of ordinary people. You do not have to be somebody of the intelligence that we are in this room. You do not have to have the education level of people in this room. Ordinary people are capable of understanding this information if we only go to the effort of presenting it to them in a form that they can engage with. And engagement is essential here because it's not just giving them information, it's giving them an opportunity to act. That's what engagement is. It's different than compliance. It works totally different than the way we talk about behavior in medicine today. And this information is out there. I've been talking today about latent information, all this information that, we're not, we're, that, that exists in the system that we're not putting to use, but there are all sorts of other bodies of information that are coming online. And we need to recognize the capacity of this information to engage people, to help people, and to change the course of their lives. Thank you very much.